going to kind of pick up where Tom left off. He gave you a very good introduction on how the uh, STR-based assay is very similar to what we talked about with mitochondrial DNA this morning. And I'm going to do my typical role of doing more on the population genetics and statistical issues, but in, all in all, this is actually very, very significant and very cool stuff. Finding the SNPs within the STR is, isn't anything new, but our ability to utilize that information is. So, you know, we're all very used to using the STR markers in forensic analysis. They've been around, you know, we're comfortable with them. Um, no doubt they're the mainstay. One of the biggest issues that comes up in discussions all the time is, you know, how can we ever think about switching away from our you know, beloved STR technology? Any other kind of technology would mean that we would have to totally retool, retool our databases, retool the way we were thinking about things and interpreting things. You know, so SDRs are kind of here to stay, and that, that's a good thing. They're very useful markers. And the way we utilize them is in a very, oh, general, very basic manner. All we're looking at is the distribution of nominal repeats on these STR loci based on a sequence motif. And that sequence motif is based on something that was originally described in GenBank. And for most of us, in terms of being practitioners of this, this is all that we need to know to utilize the systems we're currently using, go into court and testify, look at publications on databases, search for things in CODIS, and that's all well and good. Um, for the most part, the STR markers we use aren't really the best type of marker for population studies. And that's because there's a great disproportion of common alleles to rare alleles. You know, we can all think about, you know, our favorite or least favorite STR markers where there's some alleles in them that are very common in all populations. We know when we see those, that means, you know, our stats are basically not going to be outstanding. But there are also instances where we have rare alleles that when we see them, we're like, hmm, we notice it. We haven't seen them before. As a result, they haven't been seen very much in the database before. And statistically, they become a lot stronger to us. So in a perfect sense, in a population genetics type of marker system, we'd like to have markers that are all basically the same distribution throughout the population. You know, that's one of the things they look at with SNP markers, for instance. You'd like to get a balanced SNP marker that's roughly 50-50. It has the most information content because you're not overweighing one allele with the other in vast, large portions of your population. You know, so that's one of the things we have to deal with with the STRs, the way we're using them right now. One of the other things um, is how we incorporate the STRs in our day-to-day -day -day work. There are a lot of assumptions that we have to make about STO markers depending on the type of investigation we're doing with them. You know, whether you're looking at evidentiary material to a suspect in a case, whether you're looking at a paternity testing kind of example, whether you're doing mass disaster or missing persons identifications, all of those things, we're using the same STR marker. We're treating it the same way across the board, but we're making assumptions in each one of those examinations that are very, very different. So um, there's some problems with that. The way we use STR markers right now, we're looking at these things, these alleles, as being identical by state. They're nothing more than a number. And that number has a certain oh, frequency, probability of occurrence in our databases. And, you know, that's fine. You know, when you're doing the analysis of an evidentiary blood stain to a suspect, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's no ideas, no thoughts, no connotations of ancestry or descent in these markers. We're doing an apple-to-apple -apple kind of comparison here. These have to be the same profiles across the board. There doesn't need to be anything more than that. So for the vast majority of our work, hmm, SDRs are fine the way they are. Why mess with them, right? So let's just take a look at something that might be an example here. You know, we've just picked an allele, an 11 allele. Who cares what locus it is? It doesn't really matter. You know, they're all independent. This is just a number. We look at these three samples here, and in the typical forensic context, 
we would have no problem at all saying that these three samples came from three different individuals. They have different genotypes. They each have an 11 allele, but that doesn't matter. It's just a placeholder in this regard. So, for most of our purposes, that might be fine. But what if we start changing the question? What if that's not the question? Whether this sample came from this individual or this individual. If that was the case, these guys would be excluded from being the contributor for that. But what if we ask this question? Okay, and this is a topic that's coming up more and more in the last couple of years and can give, our, give us great problems with our SDR markers the way we treat them. You know, if we start asking, could these individuals be siblings? Could there be a parent-offspring relationship? Or are these per individuals unrelated individuals? See how we change the rules? Now our STR marker doesn't really help us very much. And these guys could be siblings, just looking at it blankly. Any one of these could go to the other two as a parent-offspring relationship. Or looking at the 11 in the sense that it's just a number, yeah, they could be totally unrelated individuals. You know, if we added a generation to this and had a little bit more information about where these samples come from, like we typically do with forensic paternity cases, general parentage evaluations, missing persons, mass disasters, things change a little bit. You know, we can see directly looking at the parents of these individuals that those two drop out right away. Okay, we have more information to base this on. We can see where these 11 alleles are coming from. In this case, it's coming from a father over here. In this case, it's coming from a mother over here. What's going on over here? The parents don't even have the 11 allele. But this 10 over here could have undergone mutation, making it into an 11. Right? That's a common process. That's something we don't have to think about when we're comparing evidence to a suspect but it's something that's a real strong reality once you start crossing generational boundaries. We know very well how the mutation process occurs in STR loci. Matter of fact, you see it happen every time you run a test. Right? This mutation rate in STRs is fairly high, about 10 to the minus 3. We see in our parentage testing operation, oh, probably 3 or 4 a week. And I get calls from people in crime labs who get stuck doing a forensic paternity maybe once every two or three years. You know, sometimes you're lucky and you don't have a mutation and the life is good. You can go right on, run it in pop stats, get the stats for it. But if you have a mutation, you're in big trouble. Because now how do you deal with that statistically? How You have a whole slew of other assumptions that have to be made to analyze that correctly. This is something that's very common once you start crossing generalized boundaries. Just for a point of comparison, the mutation rate of a SNP marker system is on the order of 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8. Much, much rarer event. That's why everybody likes the idea of these SNPs, especially for generational type studies, because they don't undergo mutation at a very rapid rate. You know, one of the things that we can notice when we look at enough pedigrees, enough of these family trees and having done these studies is, you know, what we're typically seeing is the new allele that's being generated in the offspring is either one repeat larger or smaller than the ancestral one. So that gives us some idea of how we can go ahead interpreting these things. And it becomes in handy. And like I said, you guys see this every day. Every time you see a stutter peak, which was brought up uh, you know, in Tom's talk, you know, you're looking at the same thing as a mutation. Think of your PCR process as hundreds of generations going by okay, in the PCR replication. That's what's going on during meiosis when you have all of these things occurring in a natural sense. So where do we see our stutter peaks? Well, they're typically n minus 4 or n plus 4. Sometimes we can even see them down to n minus 8, right? You know, you can see enough of it if you have enough sample in there and run enough cycles. So the process itself through slippage is a well-characterized process of the stepwise mutation model for molecular evolution. It's nothing we don't know about.
but that changes our rules when we're looking about at these kinds of things. You know, these mutations throw a little bit of a hampering in there. They're interesting when you look at them. And say you wanted to go back a few generations, you can see if you, as you go back generations, you have lots of these things that could occur. You know, this 10 allele, it might have been a 10 allele for many, many generations, and this was the lucky soul who, uh, you know, obtained that errant gamete. You know, you can look up the trail here and you can see where these 11s are coming from in a pedigree. Now, you're not usually not this lucky to get pedigrees that go back this far. You have to collect them for many years before you can actually work with real data on these things. You know, but, uh, you know, in this kind of a sense here, you know, looking at what this individual's type is, well, if we look at this particular makeup, well, the 11 has to come from the mother in this particular case, even though this offspring also has the 13. But our assumptions that are being made most of the time when you're typing is that since this individual, the father in this case, has the 13, and this one has the 11, the most parsimonious, the simplest solution to this is that mom gave the 11 and dad gave uh, the 13. But what about this 12? Remember what we said, one step up or one step down, one repeat motif. If that one gets zapped and has undergone mutation, then that changes the whole rules of how we would even handle this in our analysis. It changes the pedigree of the allele. I'm looking at something different here, right? I'm not looking at the pedigree of the individual. We're tracking alleles when we're looking at STR alleles over generations, okay? So if we look at this one in that sense there, that means the 13 now has come from mom and this 12 has mutated to become the 11, which is okay, you know, if we can test and show that that's actually in fact true. Typically, you have to run many more STR loci to be able to substantiate that because, well, it could mean that, yes, this mutated or actually maybe this isn't dad. Maybe this guy's brother is dad and brother had the 11. You know, so you have to always take into account other first order relatives if your question is what is the true structure of the pedigree. You know, if we look at a couple of different things, we put our 12 back and leave our pattern alone and we add another generation where these two here stem from common ancestors. Now, now where did our 11s come from? Okay, we've changed the history of that 11 allele substantially because these guys here that we were saying all along were unrelated individuals, now they're third cousins. Okay, so when you start talking about all this familial searching and things like that, we have to have a more powerful marker than just these alleles that we just give these rather arbitrary numerical designators to. They don't have any meaning in that regard when you start looking at them across a pedigree. What we really need for that kind of test is markers that are more identical by descent, something that's trackable. We have two great systems that do that for us now mitochondrial DNA that we were talking about before, maternally inherited, and then we have Y markers, whether they're Y SNPs or Y SDRs is really irrelevant, you know, but both of those give you a good clue and directionality to the parental or the paternal side of the parentage, right? So that's something that we want to look at. And making the assumption that our STRs, the way we're using them at this moment, fit and identical by descent model, like they want to try to do with familial searching in databases, you know, as broad as convicted felon databases is clearly a fallacy. You know, they're only numbers. That's what we put them in there. They're arbitrary numbers. They don't stem from any kind of relationship unless we have a way of tracking that. So that becomes somewhat of a problem. We're changing the rules of how we're doing STR analysis. And you guys thought we were you know, pretty much happy and ready to go with STRs just the way they came. There are all kinds of little tricks and twists to the road ahead of us with regard to those things. So what are some of the things that we have to deal with? Well, we've known that there are SNP polymorphisms <coughs> in the STRs. We knew that for a long time. You look in GenBank, you could have seen that there were some motifs that had an occasional SNP thrown in, right? So that's nothing 
really new, you'd have to go through sequencing of these, first of all, cloning out the particular chromosome and the particular amplicon that you're trying to get, and then sequencing that, and from that you could determine that, and uh, how many of you, of you want to do that as routine casework? I mean, that would not be very much fun. So for the most part, we haven't explored this very much. Now, many times where we do see them and they come to light to us is when they're in the case of a primer binding mutation where we see extreme peak height differences and things like that and we're wondering what's going on. Some of these things were well described in the development of our multiplex kits because they were basically population dependent. Certain groups and certain populations had these primer binding mutations that caused us all kinds of trouble. You know, they would drop out on us in the worst case scenario or give us extreme peak height and balance because of primer efficiency. So we knew that they were there. You know, sometimes they're micro variants. In, uh, insertions and deletions, some of our repeat motifs are not the simple GATC you know, repeated ad nauseum. Some of them have quite a bit of sequence within the repeats, complex structures and so on, that we could find these variants in them if we sequenced enough of them. But that's what it took to do it. We had to sequence enough of them. Okay? And that's something that we don't want to do. Sequencing these STRs is not fun. Um, so based on all of this and from the work that has been done, you know, initially you know, this is something that I was thinking about already many years ago. And the comment that came back to me very often is, well, uh, who cares about these SNPs in there? You know, they occur so rarely, there are not going to be that many of them there, and we're not going to see very many of them. Well, as uh, Tom pointed out in his talk here, that's definitely false. Uh, there are a lot more there than we suspected initially. And they become very, very usable for our purposes. You know, so one of the things that we got involved with the IBIS folks is looking at this a little bit closer. Uh, Tom mentioned we had, you know, almost 600 samples or so that we sent from our three population groups, Caucasians, African Americans, and Southwest Hispanics, typed them for the 13 core loci, you know, and try to get a handle on what the distribution is. Now, the set that he got from this had many fewer individuals in there. You know, even 600 individuals is nowhere near enough to really characterize the possible range of allelic distribution in these. We need to type a lot more to really get a better understanding of the population genetics of these markers. Uh, all of these samples had been previously typed with Paraplex 16, so we knew what the answers were. And when we got the data back, we looked at all of these with, you know, your typical population genetics things. Are the loci showing up in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? The uh, big difference is now there are a lot more alleles in that each sample than we had before. And we checked, rechecked the linkage on them. All of that worked out fine. It was no different than what we saw in the initial papers Bruce had written, you know, years ago. The, the, the STR markers themselves the loci that we're using are good markers for the purposes that we want. And additionally, we also had about 50 individuals that belonged to two extensive pedigrees that we wanted to look at. Um, and we looked at those primarily for the distribution of the STR markers themselves, as well as the SNPs within them. Of the markers, I broke it down a little bit differently than Tom did. Uh, Tom listed that many of them found SNPs in them, but not all of them are that informative. Uh, there were seven of the core loci that actually contained enough polymorphism and enough instance of the presence of these SNP-bearing alleles in their populations to make them useful. You know, that one-off rare allele is not going to help us in forensic work. It's going to be the ones that have a more of a presence there. We don't want to have to have every STR allele that has a SNP in it be the minimum allele frequency, for instance. You know, that's not going to help us very often because we're not going to see it that often. Right? So we, found, we picked out seven of them as being probably the most productive of the group. And that would be these guys here. Many of these are ones that Tom just showed you. And uh, 
they're very interesting. They have different motif setups, and one of the things we're going to be looking at as we expand the number of samples type is how does motif play in the distribution of these in the population. Now, Tom pointed out that one of the biggest things, the first thing that you notice when you look at this is that the allele count at these loci go up. You know, anywhere between 4 and 15 new alleles, you know, sometimes more as you add more samples to it. Um, that's a good thing. And we're up here in, in the range of, of samples where these aren't just rare one-offs that we're looking at. These are well embedded in these populations, different alleles. And uh, looking at the concordance between Powerplex 16 was great. One of the things that wasn't pointed out by Tom or Les, which kind of surprised me in their talks, is that the way the typing is done, both for the STRs and for mitochondrial DNA, is fully reverse compatible with what we have in our databases today. We can take any genotype from the STRs and convert that into mass amounts. The same thing with the mitochondrial DNA sequences. We can take them and we can turn them into mass measurements and compare them to the technology that we're looking at here with the IBIS platform. You know, same thing the way it is right now. We can type something for the STRs on the IBIS and we can ignore the SNPs. You know, that's what, a flick of the button or you switch which sheet you look on on the results. That, there's nothing to it. And that data then would be completely compatible with what's in CODIS today. All right. Yes, sir. Tom and I were leaving that for Bruce to handle. Oh, well. Who <laughs> <laughs> are you? <laughs> okay, that's fine. But, you know, I think, you know, that's something that you really significantly have to think about because, you know, other platforms that are proposed, you know, SNP based platforms, you know, like they're incorporating in, in Europe and so on, that would require a total change in architecture to what our convicted felon databases and forensic indices are, which can be very useful for additional marker systems. And, you know, in some cases there are better marker systems that could be developed for pedigree-based studies and familial relationship than our STRs are, you know. But right now, do we want to, you know, scrap what we've built the last 10 years and switch to something totally new? Well, that wouldn't really work very well, would it? But this way allows you compar cap compatibility between both of them. So that's a very good thing to think about. This isn't something new that is isolated. This is new, but it's totally integrated into what we've been doing for the last 12 years. So that's kind of refreshing in that regard. If we look at some of the data, these graphs are big and the numbers are little and hopefully uh, some of you will spend some time staring at them because there's a lot that can be found on these. We're basically comparing our top players here of the STR markers across our three population groups and here's data collected incorporating the SNPs with the STRs and here it is with the SNPs basically stripped from the analysis. So. These data here are exactly what you would find if you were typing it on a C platform today. Okay, they're no different. But there are some, if we focus in on the top of this a little bit, you can see some major steps being taken here. We're going from 14 alleles to 23 alleles, from 8 alleles to 18 alleles. You know, that's what we want. To get better power of discrimination, we have to increase the num total number of alleles, and we don't want them all to be these rare offshoots. And we can see that when we look at some of the population measures. Here's the observed uh, homozyg or uh, heterozygosity. Pardon me, I'm drying out up here. Not thinking right. You know, if we look at these values, we can see that there's a major increase in the heterozygosity that we're observing. Now, this has some other implications other than, uh, yeah, their numbers, statistics. You figured I'd be up here talking about that, right? But what this means is something Tom brought out. All of these things that we've been calling homozygotes all these years, many of them aren't. And that also means that all of our work in establishing what 
theta and population substructure based on our STR markers is inaccurate in that regard because we weren't typing them to their full capacity. It's good if we want to keep it at this, then those estimates are there and go ahead and do theta correction on all homozygotes. But a lot of these homozygotes are truly heterozygotes where they would have no need for any kind of theta correction. The way we do it, at least in forensics, in population studies and inbreeding studies, of course, you would incorporate any population substructure inbreeding coefficients in your work, which is an issue when you're doing familial studies and so on. So the implications are a lot broader than just, ah, we got more alleles. It has a lot to do with how we're going to utilize these in the future. Okay, there are three of the SNPs that, at least in the data set that I have, didn't have any kind of polymorphisms in them. I think this is very, very interesting. One of the things I want to start looking in is why don't they have any SNP polymorphisms? And for that, we need a lot more population studies on particular groups and things like that and increased numbers. It's very, very interesting that they don't. Uh, some of the other markers only yielded a few, so they're kind of middle of the road. Yeah, you're going to pick up your occasional SNP, but it's not going to have the same impact on an overall case as the other seven we talked about before would. So these don't affect the distributions of alleles nearly as much. So here's those that have a few. You can see where here it's nine, here it's 11. You know, these have no difference. So all of our markers are still very useful. It's just some of them have SNPs that are making them more useful than others. Okay. One of the things uh, that has to be dealt with is how do we name these alleles? How do we database these alleles? Now, as you saw in, in the talk that Tom gave, he typically has a mark with the allele count number, how many repeats there were, and then what the SNP was typically a G and then a carrot to an A and things like that. Um, while that's 100% accurate and correct, it is a nightmare if you want to put it into any kind of software to analyze data or to have very, very robust search algorithms. And how do you handle some of the other things? So one of the things Tom and I worked out was some nomenclature that could be universally applied that's unambiguous for what we're actually seeing. You know, so. We looked at, of course, the number of repeats. That's still a significant thing, you know, how many repeats are there. But then we added su uh, suffixes to them that describe the type of polymorphism. They can be transitions, transversions. And in many cases, we see multiple instances of SNPs within these alleles. So that has to be captured as well. So going back to your old molecular biology lectures, you all remember what transitions and transversions were. One of the things that Tom mentioned that the A to G or the G to the A was a very common thing. Well, transitions occur at a much higher rate than transversions, uh, even more so in mitochondrial DNA, actually. So those are what we'd expect. And if you broke these out in a table, you could just see that there are 12 different categories of polymorphisms that you could expect at any particular site. So instead of coming up with something far out and bizarre, the thought was, why not use this? This is foundational molecular biology. There's no question with this regard. So what we did is we gave it a coding system, S1 through S12, S standing for SNP. OK, we weren't that creative, OK? But it unambiguously describes what kind of difference there is in between these various markers. You know, and all of these are going to be based on some reference sequence that's out there. And I'll show you that in a minute. So if we had a 12 allele that contains an A to a G polymorphism, that would be a 12S2. If we had a 12 that contained an A to a G and a C to a T, two SNPs in there, it would be 12S2, S4. See where they are? Okay. What about one that contained two A to G polymorphisms? Well, for that, we added this little suffix on the end, point two, designate how many of these polymorphisms were detected. 
Now, one of the things that, you know, is very similar to with mitochondrial DNA typing using this is we don't know where these particular SNPs are in the range of the sequence that we're looking at. We know they exist based on their base compositions. We don't know where they are. But SNPs have a very, very low mutation rate. Okay, so for the most part, we making the assumption that if we look at two sequences that are 12 with an A to a G in them is less of a stretch than looking at two individuals who show nothing but a 12, where one might have the SNP and might not. We're a lot safer at maintaining that these things are more comparable, that these alleles could be dealt with as identical by descent, even though what we're really saying is that unless we sequence them, we don't know that they actually occurred from the same mutational event. But they're still a better marker than what we're existing, dealing with right now. Okay. Now, I mentioned that these are based on sequence composition. We don't need allelic ladders, like Tom said. And actually, you know, when we're doing STRs the way we do them now, we have not only a allelic ladder, but we also have the internal lane sta standard that has to calibrate all these things. Then all this nice fluorescence that can really gum up the works in case multi-component analysis isn't working very well on breaking out the colors. So there are lots of things that can go wrong with the CE approach that we're used to dealing with. Well, the beauty of this is you don't even have to deal with those kind of issues. So uh, it makes life a lot easier. So we don't have to deal with allelic ladders. What we're doing is we're comparing the nomenclature, the naming of the alleles directly to a reference sequence. For every STR system that's out there, there are reference sequences listed. You can go to Starbase and look up what they are for that matter. So if we were looking at D8, D8 is a simple repeat, TCTA. Nice, tidy, not all of them are nice and tidy, but the reference sequence has a GenBank accession number and the reference sequence had 12 repeats in it. So if you go to that GenBank record, you get a little bit of information about it, but there's a sequence. If we blow this up a little bit, you can see here is our TCTA, TCTA, and so on and so on. Now, what Tom has done is taken this information in the software, calibrated the mass measurements to code against this, and that this tells him what the mass should be for a 12-repeat TCTA in D8. It makes it very, very clean and easy in that regard. Well, I don't know how easy it was to program it. I know I couldn't do it. But it sure makes it very easy to interpret the data and utilize it. Okay. So if we're looking at sequence, and this is actually from a part of a slide Tom sent me a while back that I trimmed down and modified a little bit, but we can see that we have the reference sequence put in here and a series of samples, 11s and 12s. We can see that there are SNP polymorphisms in here, as well as additional repeat motifs. Okay? So the 12 alleles represented by the reference, 12 and 13s have various SNPs. And here's where this is a software dependent thing. You know, you don't know for sure that this repeat was added on there. It could have been duplicated somewhere in here. It could have been duplicated somewhere down here. You know, this is just a convenience step. But if you sequence this DNA from both directions to confirm it, this is where the additional, we know that the additional repeat motif is somewhere in this block of repeat motifs, and it wasn't down on this end. So that much, you know, we can tell you from looking at the sequence. Can't tell you how it got there, not yet at least. Okay, so if we look at this up close and personal, how does our nomenclature fit in? So here's a 12 containing an A to a G, so that's a 12S2. So that's what that would actually look like if you sequenced it. But luckily, you don't have to sequence it. All right. Same thing if we look at 13S2. Okay. And here's that 13S2, S5. Okay, so we have you know, our transition and a transversion. Now, one of, I keep saying that we're going to have to type a whole lot more samples to really get a good understanding of how these things behave in populations. I mean, 
That's stuff I like to know. Do you need to know that to be able to implement the stuff in forensic casework? No, not really. You know, but it's good foundational knowledge. You know, we know that transitions and transversions occur at different rates. Where and when, in what population group did that polymorphism occur is something that I'm usually interested in. Because one of the things that we can find from looking at enough of this data and kind of redoing our FST type studies or population subdivision studies with broader sample sets is gaining an idea of how these STR loci evolved in human populations over time. We might be able to determine whether or not, okay, we have slippage occurred. What if it occurred with a snip in the middle of it? Could that have caused this? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not in this instance, but maybe at another locus with a different motif. You know, those are all basic biology questions that you know, will eventually work out that will add to the foundation for our STR typing systems as a whole. Now, I'm going to apologize for these graphs. They're extremely busy. Now, needless to say, I would normally have these blown up on a wall, you know, the size of this room, and you could actually see the differences, but take a close look at them. What we have in here are pairwise comparisons between the different populations, the three population groups for D8. We looked at the IBIS method where we actually captured the SNP information, and then the standard typing method where we ignored the SNPs. And we're going to get into a couple of close-up shots of this that make it look very much more clear. But there are definite patterns, and these patterns seem to be somewhat consistent even among the loci. We'll point those out as we go. How comparable is this to what's in our databases today? Okay, we've typed you know, more individuals than were typed in the in initial STR studies. Uh, if we strip away the SNP data, here's the distribution. We have just our nominal alleles, 8, 9, 10, so on and so on. You know, here almost 35% is a 13. So is that 13 really very useful to us in that regard? Well, it would not be, it would be a lot more useful if it was closer in frequency to these guys here, wouldn't it? All right. But if we look at the data from the CODIS STR papers that Bruce published a long time ago, that was 10 years ago, wasn't it? So we can see that there's virtually no difference in the allele frequencies, and statistically there's no difference. I did test that, you know, between this population data set and what's in the database now. So the data, in, in essence, is totally comparable. Now what happens if we forget about the standard way of doing things and start looking at SNP polymorphisms? Well, if we go up this chart, we're not going to do this for every locus, okay? Relax, it's not going to be that bad, okay? But we have 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, 11 has some, but they don't show up in this population. Then we have 12, but now we're picking up a little. Here's that S2. All right, so it's showing up in there. It's still pretty low. But what happens when we hit 13? Remember our 13 that was at 35? The 35 isn't even on this graph anymore. All right, 30, this 13 is split between 13, which call it maybe a wild type, and this 13S2, okay? We've basically now split what was considered one allele into two, and both of them have respectable frequencies that make them more useful. As we go up the chain here, here's the 14. We can see that our 14 allele is much less than the one that contains the SNP. When we get to 15, there is no wild type anymore. They're all containing the SNP, as with 16 and 17. This trend of simple to incurring a polymorphism in the larger alleles is perfectly in line with what we would expect in populations evolving over time. They incur a mutation when it's simple, and then that is distributed among the various populations, some populations isolating, going off one direction, containing less and less of them. You know, so it's something that you would almost expect to see. How far back these polymorphisms were incurred, that I can't tell you yet. But that's something that would definitely be interesting to look at. The same kind of pattern 
shows up in, we looked at Caucasian, same kind of pattern shows up in African Americans, but in some instances, in some low side, the pattern is actually flipped, where the predominant types are the wild type throughout, and you see this different trailing off of the incurrence of SNPs, and the African American populations also show many more polymorphisms. Notice a lot of these numbers don't have bars here for the Caucasians. The Caucasians are a highly derived population. You know, you get to an ancestral population, uh, like of African origin, you're going to see more SNPs at your loci. So it becomes very useful. So when we compare the two next to one another, we can see what effect this has on what the frequency tables will be that we use to calculate our random match probabilities, likelihood ratios, and all these other things that we typically do with them. We see the similar kind of pattern going on with the other majorly polymorphic loci. And in general, in all cases, the predominant alleles at high frequency are being chopped down into more manageable units with lower frequencies, making them much more valuable to us statistically. There's D13, there's VWA, and of course, the more complex you get in terms of the motif, uh, and the more alleles you get, the tighter here's D3. D3 is very interesting. It has all kinds of things going on in it. D21, you know, I didn't even show some of the other ones because they were just too much to cram on one slide. So this opens up a big window of what we can do application-wise with the STRs and the power we have when we are interpreting our evidentiary material in whatever kind of case we're working with. You know, in the identity testing arena, it's going to greatly improve the power of exclusion and the probability of discrimination, the power of discrimination of our loci themselves. And that's something that we want to have. You have this overall reduction of homozygotes which is a good thing. Yeah, we don't have this nice rare allele frequency that we'd get from doing P squared, but we're always titering it back with an FST correction that in many cases probably shouldn't have been used because those two alleles shouldn't be of common ancestry, depending on the population they're in. All right? We get all this information and we're not changing our core 13 loci. We're not going to a new panel of markers. We're using the same thing we have been using, just expanding it. And the reverse compatibility to our existing database is a real significant thing. Yeah, we could probably retype the things that we have in our convicted felon databases very, very rapidly and efficiently using the IBIS platform. And that's something that would probably be a good idea, especially if we want to go forth with this familial searching stuff, right? But for the most part, we can still compare our results, even though we might be typing it today, comparing it to a sample that was typed 10 years ago. Okay. What about relationship testing? Here's where it really makes the biggest impact. We can track the SNP itself throughout a lineage. Okay. These alleles take on a different life when they contain these SNPs in them. They're not just a number to us anymore. What we have when we have an STR with SNPs in it, it becomes kind of like a haplotype. You know, the way we use mitochondrial DNA and the way we use Ys, where we can track this down through a lineage. We can say, well, he got that allele from his great, great, great grandfather. You know, that's a lot of power. And the other thing that we really want to look at is see how, not only how some of these SNPs and STRs behave in the mutation process, but we can verify that a particular allele has mutated if it still contains a SNP in it. You know, that's one of the next big things we need to look at is several hundred mutation studies from parentage testing to actually evaluate this and get a better handle on it. Okay? What about just discriminatory power? That's something we're always hung up on. Why did we go to STRs to begin with? You know, it's because they have a lot of power to them. So if we took a look at the seven main ones that really impact the difference, that uh, have good numbers of SNPs within them. Statistically, that panel of seven is as strong as a panel of ten if we weren't typing the SNPs. Okay? More bang for your buck. 
with fewer loci. Okay? If you look at calculating random match probabilities, I like to do tedious things. We took 50 random individuals, ones who weren't in the database study, and ran them up, you know, or actually 50 that were in the database study because I needed to have the SNP data on them, right? and we ran those up. The numbers on average decreased about 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 in terms of their random match probabilities. So these things do become a lot rarer. Even though we're getting rid of the homozygotes, we're still achieving much more power in our comparisons. Okay? I want to plot some of this out, calculating the power of discrimination for the individual loci. This cluster that's up on top here represents the three population groups typed with SNPs, while the one on the bottom is just the STRs counted as nominal alleles. And one of the things that you can see is that statistically, the power of discrimination of these various loci, all of the various different loci we looked at, is considerably greater than in what it was. You know, and that goes back into line with saying, OK, well, these seven are as good as 10 of your regular STRs. So that's something that you achieve. Something interesting, I didn't pick this order for any particular reason. It just happened to be how I had them in my spreadsheet, so they look a little bit bouncing around. But one of the things that happens is they tighten up. The distributions tighten up between the races. You know, and that's kind of an interesting thing. That could be caused by a variety of things. One, we're evening out the allele distributions a little bit more, you know, capturing more of the information that's there. And there's actually good discrimination between some of the groups at some of the loci. But this is something that is more erratic when we don't look at the SNPs within the SDRs. This needs some more looking at. Do, we do a lot of relationship testing in my lab. We do a lot of paternity testing, a lot of missing persons work. So to us, this is kind of like you know, the cherry on top of the whipped cream for using SDRs and analyses. Since we can track the alleles through the pedigrees, those markers, statistically, yeah, they help. But the other thing that they do that you don't really think about that much is what happens when you search with them, OK? Right now, when we conduct searches, and say you're having 11 allele, well, you search a database, it's going to match up with every 11 allele if you're running under low stringency looking for a parent-offspring relationship or something like that. Well, if you've refined your SNP STR allele definition, a lot of those ones that might be 11 alleles but don't contain that particular SNP or any other for that matter are no longer part of the noise that you get when you get back an NDIS level search. Okay? It has the same effect even though statistically it's better, it has the same kind of sorting effect as being able to incorporate mitochondrial DNA haplotypes or Y haplotypes in an actual search. So it, it's going to make that just that much more easier to do. Uh, so it'll definitely aid in mass disaster scenario and missing person scenarios where we're not doing our apple to apple perfect match search like you deal with in a regular forensic aspects of CODIS. We don't have that luxury. You know, we're looking for relatives. So all of this stuff has a big role on what about all this familial searching. Now, California now is basically forced to doing it. Several other states are looking at doing that. But remember what I said about all these alleles. The markers themselves are not appropriate for doing this because they're just identity by in-state. You know, they're numbers. They have no ancestry attached to them. Not like when you have a SNP within them. Then it takes that meaning a little bit further. Here's a pedigree. Now, like I said, it takes a while to assemble individual pedigrees that have a lot of individual generations in them and persons. We have some good contributors of these things that we draw from. But here's an example of D3. And if we look at the pedigree, we have our samples some of these individuals aren't typed, for instance. We didn't have access to those samples. And we look at their genotypes. These are the genotypes using the nomenclature that I described here. Do you need to know what the nomenclature is? You know, 
well, you should know it somewhere along the line, but it's not something that's ever going to come and visit you when you're talking about allele designations. That's a designation. Calling 18S1 is no different than calling this a 14, and that an 18, or whatever else. So don't get bogged down by oh, the, all these new things we have to know. You don't really need to know them. But as we look at these things, you know, let's look at you know, the matriarch of this particular pedigree. She's a 16, 18S1, so she contains a polymorphism. If we designate that polymorphism with the asterisk here, we can see that we find that in two of her offspring. Uh, we've now matched this transmission. You know, if we look over here, this father over here is, has, also has a polymorphism, 17S1. That can be transmitted to his daughter over here. If we look at this character over here, 27, notice this one here was a homozygote. Okay? Where we would have been dealing with this individual as a homozygote, before, now it's a heterozygote. But we know where the two alleles came from. Well, if this is true, this part of the pedigree is true, and also for that matter, look at this one up here, you know, 18 is the brother over here, also is homozygous, heterozygous, whatever you want to name it in this particular instance, also contains the SNP. So we know this one has an 18, that one has an 18, but it wasn't the 18 from mom, right? This becomes a real kind of issue when you're doing pedigree statistics and doing kinship statistics for missing persons IDs. Because one of the things you have to do if one of these individuals is missing is you have to work through the pedigree of who has the alleles that you know, might match up to being transmitted to this individual. We don't know anything about dad up here, or do we? Well, by doing this approach, we know that now that dad has to have an 18 at a minimum, right? And we know that that 18 doesn't have a SNP. <coughs> yeah, you could have said dad has an 18 before without looking at the SNPs, right? But now you can actually take a look at that a little bit further, and you can see that the 18 from dad, the wild type, if you will, is actually transmitted through this pedigree a lot further than the one with the SNP does. Now, does that have anything to do with whether it had a SNP or not? I doubt it. You know, it's a shuffling of the cards. But the individual alleles themselves become much more valuable to tracking in pedigrees. You know, so it expands the range of who can be family reference samples for a missing persons case. That's just D3, here's D13. It's the same little pedigree. Actually, this pedigree has a lot of other branches to it. I've narrowed it down just for this purpose. You know, we've got a SNP over here in mom again. You know, where does it show up? Well, there it is in 27. There it is in the great-granddaughter. There it is in the great-great-great-granddaughter. Okay, gone all the way down the family tree here, tracking that particular allele. This guy over here was a homozygote, now is a heterozygote, and we can track that SNP-bearing allele down to his offspring and his granddaughters. So you see, it's, it's a two-way <coughs> of looking at this kind of approach. Yeah, the statistics are much better, and that becomes handy, but these things are not only characters on a frequency table anymore, they're actually players in the pedigree that we can use for sorting purposes and searching purposes and filtering metrics and things like that. And when you're doing database searching, you know, a needle in the haystack approach to it, this becomes much more valuable. Here's another example of the 12S9 showing up in this father, showing up in his kids. So all of these things expand the range and the ability, the power at which you're going to have meaningful kinship statistics. And of course, you know, couple this kind of a thing with Mito, right? Did anybody notice that all these guys that are shaded blue all would have the same mitochondrial DNA type? Can be typed on the same platform, right? Hmm? They were. Yeah. You know, so that becomes a very, very useful 
feature. You can triangulate your identities on m many more scales. You want a nice pedigree? Uh, this one's interesting. All what I can say is that poor woman. <laughs> you know, my hats are off to her. You know, but if you look at this kind of a pedigree here, you know, if we look at D3 again, here's the matriarch of the family, and here's the patriarch of the family. He had a snip in both. You know, what does that mean? I wished I had ten generations from him going back, and that might be interesting. You know, but one never knows. So if we look at how do these things transmit, if we look at just the 15S1, you find that a little bit more than half of his, his offspring actually have that SNP. Those are all his kids. And then going down the next generation, all the way down to the fourth generation. All right. So we look at the other allele, its distribution you know, is not as broad. But still, those added little bits of information can make a search that much more effective. Now, if we look at this one over here, you know, this one has two SNPs. This is one of those 15S1s that has two of those polymorphisms, the A to G. We don't know where they are in the motifs. Could they have been caused by, you know, a slippage and duplication, or could they be totally isolated in time? Those are questions we can't answer at this point with this stuff. But uh, they're unique, unambiguous types that we would see in the mass spectra. You know, where did it come from? It came from all the way up here. You know, his mom's up here in the pedigree. So these things are very very interesting. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn about the biology of human populations from this, much more than just our application. There's a lot to do. We have to type a heck of a lot more individuals to really get a better handle. You know, as allele numbers go up at a locus, you have to type that many more samples to achieve a similar level of statistical significance that your frequency estimates are reliable, right? Basic statistics, ring a bell for anybody? Somewhere in there. But not only that, we want to get a better idea of the distribution, you know, within these population groups. You know, really reevaluate population substructure. You know, with um, mitochondrial DNA, for instance, we can look at uh, African-American populations, and we say, well, there are three major haplogroups, L1, L2, L3, and then there's all kinds of subtyping of that that can be done, especially when you look at the uh, coding region of the genome. Right, well, we couldn't do that with STRs. We might be able to do that more with this kind of an approach, not limiting it to the 13 STR loci. You know, we have to expand that as well for those kinds of studies. One of the things we want to do is sequence a number of these individuals and see where these SNPs actually fall in the sequence. Because taking a more phylogenetic approach to looking at them, you can't do any kind of phylogenetics with the STRs the way they are, you know, because they're not meaningful in that regard. But in this way, we might have a better handle on how these things are structured in populations. You know, and can it be that two individuals could both have the same code that we're giving it, allele code, but yet their SNPs are going to be in different places. I almost bank on it. You know, I'll, I'll take bets on that for anybody who says they won't. But, you know, that's something that we can definitely learn about. We see how much that occurs. And is it really going to affect how we're doing things? No, because it's still better than what we're doing today. Okay. And like I mentioned, we need to look at more markers. We have these non-CODIS loci that John Butler developed. I don't know how many of them you know, there are. Did anybody also notice that the amplicon sizes on these STRs are like 140? These are all mini STR systems. They're going to work great on degraded materials, challenged materials. You know, things that you know, we can't touch with our existing kits should type fairly well with these. You know, as would these, as would the XSTRs, 
and you really want to get into doing XSTRs, I think uh, Angela and I had a discussion about that over lunch. But, uh, you know, why STRs? But it's not limited to this. You could be looking at autosomal SNPs, Y SNPs, mitochondrial SNPs, whatever have you. Uh, of course, lots of people work on this, especially, you know, Tom and Kristen, uh, they ran all the samples up here. And I think Tom and I exchange emails more at wee hours of the morning than probably most do. But I don't think he sleeps, to tell you the truth. But uh, these are all lab staff that help gather data in my end. And if anybody really wants to get in touch with me, that's where you can find me. Okay. Any questions, comments, jokes, riddles, Angela? No joke or riddle, but. Um, with the uh, markers, the STRs that are not showing SNPs, mm -hmm. is it possible, and I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the details of the locations, is it possible that they're in gene-rich regions? Because some of them are certainly in gene regions. Well, we know so. And T-pox. And T-pox. But how do you explain VWA, yeah, which is von Willenbrand factor, right? And it's chock full. So it, I don't know, is, is VWA uh, a gene-rich region? It's closely associated with a tumor Gee, suppressor, right? Yeah. But how close it is, I don't know. I mean, that's the kind of genomics, kind of in bioinformatics work that really, coupled with the raw data of what these alleles are, coupling that back into a more bioinformatics approach to really learn a lot about STR biology. I mean, uh, it, it's possible that that could be that there might be something signaling, signaling that stretch of DNA to be more conserved. You know, methylation, who knows, you know. You know I, I don't have an answer for that one, but that's one of the things we would definitely be looking at as we expand, you know, the biological aspect of this. And do you have enough data yet to have any idea whether the mutation rate is substantially higher? Not yet. That's the next phase. All these mutation studies that I mentioned, you know, we have to look at probably three, four hundred uh, sets of mutation data uh, before we start approaching maybe a 95 percent confidence level that anything that we would see might be meaningful. So just see how the transmission and all of those things work. You know, we have enough data right now to say that. The SNPs aren't the issue. It's the STR that has a high mutation rate, and that's what causes us grief today. The SNPs themselves might actually help us resolve that issue because if the allele was a 12S1 and in the child it was an 11S1 and mom is unambiguous, well, that's a heck of a lot more likely if the SNP is transmitted along with it and you just lost one of the other repeats than it possibly being somebody else or an exclusion. Oh, it's yeah. no doubt. It's no yeah. doubt it's going to help. Yeah, yeah it's going to help, they, but how much it's going to help. high mutation rate. Right. They? No, the SNPs probably do not have a high mutation rate. And I can say that fairly comfortably looking at comparisons. If you go back and look at those allele distribution tables and look at the general trends that you see between the Caucasian group, if you can visually suck them out of the chart, and then the African-American group, and then you see the Hispanics. Well, Hispanics are an admixture, so they're very handy in that regard because you can track different lineage trends in them just very visually. Visually, it looks like you know, we're not, we don't really have to worry about the STR, the, uh, the SNP aspect of things, that these things, there's a progression going from the smaller allele to the higher allele, and sometimes they switch. So it makes you wonder which was actually the original repeat motif. Yeah. You know, but it's a lot of cool stuff, a lot of fun. At least fun for me. You guys wouldn't like it. <laughs> you would. I'm weird, too. Yeah. <laughs> you calling me weird? Oh, sorry. No, I was calling myself weird. Uh, okay. <laughs> All righty. Any other questions? All right.